Good morning. Good morning to everybody. Um, looking forward to this morning's Sunday School. Thank you so much for joining us. Many of you are usually watching Brother Whitlock or Brother Miles, so thank you for not tuning out when I tuned in. Thank you so much for, for being a part of Sunday School. Uh, today's lesson will come from a plethora of, of Scripture, and um, we're going to look at those passages of Scripture today and, and walk right through them and see what the Lord is really saying to us on today. Uh, the first passage is found in Luke chapter 2. The second passage is Acts chapter 2. And the third passage is Acts chapter 21. That is Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. And Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Uh, the subject matter for today is that this is focused on the prophesying daughters, the prophesying daughters. The daughters of, of God, the daughters of God are focused upon as those who prophesy. <clears throat> and so let's get let's get right at it. At it. Um, Acts, uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through, through 38. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. We want to look at what this, this passage is. Is trying to say to us, and then we will follow up with the following two. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through uh, 38. And there was one Anna, the, a prophetess, the daughter of Phamuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four scores and forty and four scores and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayer prayers day and night or night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him. To all them, she spoke of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Uh, the Spirit empowers the daughters to prophesy. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for every passage. We thank you for every believer. We thank you for every convert. We ask you, Father God, to continue to bless us, to walk with you, and be blessed of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. We find here that this takes place uh, during the period where prophecy was, was going on. However, during the time in biblical days, women were not to be, be ones who spoke. So this is an unusual passage from Luke as it is in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 21. Women were to not prophesy, women were not to speak out aloud, but today's lesson gives us a view of another group of women that, uh, that has changed things or in the midst of changing things. This word prophesy uh, here means to witness. This word prophesy means to give forth a missionary journey. The word is to foretell to foretell. This word prophet, prophetess at this time, as well as prophets, they were to foretell. They were to witness of Jesus Christ, and they were to be missionaries. So right off the bat, we see Anna, who is sometimes called Hannah. Uh, Anna was a prophetess. We can't be afraid of that word because it simply means to foretell. It has a, a connotation here of witnessing. It is, the, it is the same word. We get the word witnessing as well. So she is a, a female foreteller. So Anna here, being a prophetess, is a female foreteller. Well, what is she looking for? Why is she here? Why does she appear in this lesson? Well, it talks about the fact that she was looking for Jesus. She was looking to see God. As a matter of fact, she is looking to see the face of God. 
Look at her. Look at her description here. She's a prophetess. She's the daughter of Famuel or Famuel. She's the daughter of Famuel or Famuel. She is his daughter. And Famuel's name means the face of God. When you look at this word Famuel, his name actually uh, is means the face of God. So she is looking for the face of God. Jesus is, is being born during this time. As you know, in, in Luke chapter 2, it gives us this, this great story of how Christ is born. So this is no different as we move down through verses 36 and 30, 37 and 38. She is actually looking to, the, to see the face of God. Now, this woman has been blessed. She's been blessed because, number one, when the exile took place, she was spared to continue to live in the same place that she was. So she was not taken into captivity. So she's a very thankful woman. She is a praising woman. Let's look, look at what it says. It says that she was looking to see the face of God. She was the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. The tribe of Asher. And, and the King James is spelled A-S-E-R, but we know the tribe of Asher to be spelled A-S-H-E-R. So she's from the tribe of Asher, which was one of uh, Jacob's sons, one of the tribes of Israel. She was from the tribe of Asher. The reason why that's important to note is because the name Asher means happy. The name Asher means blessed. The name Asher means prosperous. So look at this woman in her description. She was a foreteller, so she was a witness. And as we go through these verses, we will find out that she even witnessed Jesus, the presence of Jesus. So she, uh, she actually was a happy woman. She was a blessed woman. She was a woman of prosper, of prosperity. So this woman from the tribe of Asher a blessed tribe, a tribe that actually means happy, actually means blessed, actually means prosperity. So this woman was a blessed woman. And because she was blessed, she spent her time in a certain place. In verse number 36, it says that she was of great age. She was an elderly woman. She was of great age. She had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. So she lived of a husband for seven years. In other words, she was married for seven years. But at this time, she is not married. Look at verse 37. And she was a widow of about four scores and four. Four scores and four. Score is 20 years Four is four more years, so we have four scores, which is 84 years old. In King James, it says this. It says, and she was a widow of about four scores and four years, meaning that she was a widow for about 84 years. So she was a seasoned woman. She was an aged woman. She was a woman who had been married for seven years. Her husband passed away. Now she's a widow woman. That's what the word widow means. She's without a husband. She once had one. And now uh, she has been a widow for about 84 years. 84 years. Now some commentators say and some theologians believe that she had been a widow woman for 84 years. And as we see here, it says so in King James. Others say that she was 84 years old. Regardless of the fact, the fact of the matter is, this woman is a seasoned, older woman who was of great age. She was a woman who's of great age. And it says, she departed not from the temple. She departed not from the temple. We can see this two ways here. Number one, she departed not from the temple. Some believe that she actually lived there. She was actually in residence at the temple. She was a woman who was so happy, so blessed, so thankful to the Lord, she moved into the temple. She moved in and moved around in the temple. She had her daily living in the temple. Others believe when it says that she did not depart from the temple, they believe that it's simply saying that when the doors of the church opened, she was there. There ought to be some people. In this day and time, when the doors of the church is open, you ought to be there. 
there ought to be some people, even on this broadcast this morning, since we're having church by live streaming, you ought to be here. <laughs> you ought to be present. And some of you are present. But the fact of the matter is, this woman was consistently present in the house of the Lord. Why was she present? She was blessed. She was favored. She was a woman who had, had been blessed of the Lord, and she was thankful unto him. Are you blessed of the Lord? Are you thankful unto him? Have God blessed you in such a way that you're so glad that he has done it that you're going to praise him? You're going to worship him? You're going to spend your time around his house and in his house? This woman spent her time in the temple. She did not depart from the temple. Another point that is to be brought out here, when, it, when we say she did not depart from the temple, one thing we say is she did not give in to distractions. This woman, this foreteller, this witness unto the Lord, this older woman, this woman from the tribe of Asher, the eighth son of Jacob, Asher was the eighth son of Jacob, she did not, did not depart from the temple. She stayed there in the temple. She worshiped God in the temple. She spent time. She valued church. Do you value church? Is church important to you? Is it, is it now during this pandemic, since we are not going in and out of the building on a consistent basis, that church doesn't matter to you? Is it at this time in your life, a, a time where, where we need church, we need God more than ever before? Is it this time in your life that you become in a relaxed state where you're so relaxed until you don't value church? This woman, Anna, valued church. She valued worship. Do you value worship this morning? Is worship important to you? Is worship something that you value, that, that you put a high price tag on? Church is very, very valuable. It's a good place to be. It's a good place to be. It is a good place to be. Now, her being a prophetess means that she talked about Jesus to everybody that would listen. She talked about Jesus. Let's go further. Verse number 37. But she served God with fasting and prayers night and day. This woman was faithful. This woman was faithful in fasting. She was faithful in prayers and she did it both day and night, both night and day. Now, some of us may be, may be good in praying during the day as we moving around and that we ought to do, but this woman was not only faithful in prayer and in fasting day, she was also uh, praying and fasting during the night. So we need somebody who's consistent. If you are a prayer warrior, if, if you really love the Lord, if you really feel blessed and thankful to the Lord, first of all, this woman was praying and fasting. Fasting means she set a, a, herself apart from those things she usually do. She set herself apart from the foods that she usually eat. She set herself apart from food completely at moments. Is fasting important to you? See, in the midst of our fast, things ought to happen. Number one, when we fast, we remove the distractions of food. We, move, we remove the distractions of the, the things of this world. We fast and we're saying to God, God, speak to us. God, bless us. I am willing to give up the food that I eat on a regular basis just to hear from you, Lord. We ought not wait until... Uh, trouble hits for us to fast. We ought not wait until we get in a bind for us to fast. We ought not wait until the world is turned upside down when we are hoping that it becomes turned right side up again that we ought to fast. This woman served God with fasting night and day. She did not depart from the temple. She did not uh, uh, this woman saw the importance of being at church and she saw the importance of denying food in order to get in touch with God. Food is what we need. We have to have it 
But the fact of the matter is when we want to strongly acknowledge and get in touch with God, fasting may become necessary. The word fasting means to cover one's mouth, means to push back from the table. The, 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 the word fasting means a shut or a closed or a covered mouth. Anna was, was one who, who valued the church. She valued the temper, temper, temple, but she also valued fasting. Do you value fasting? Will you say, well, preacher, I can't do that. I've never done that before. I say to you today, if you really want to hear from the Lord in a mighty way, try fasting. Do it, do it, do it. And then this woman was a woman of prayers. She believed that God could change things. Therefore, she prayed to the almighty God. This woman believed that if she fasts to get in tune with God, when you walk around in your house or you stand in a particular room or you stand outside, there are... There are signals and waves. There are Wi-Fi signals. There are radio signals. There are TV waves. There, there's audio all around you, but you can't see it. You can't hear it. But when you turn on a radio, turn on a TV, turn over an iPad, turn on a computer, you dial it in, you tune it in. Through prayer and fasting, we tune God in. It's important to note that this woman paid attention to prayer, paid attention to fasting. She valued both of them so very much until she was in tune with God night and day. Now, when you look at this, these words, night and day, uh, it's not only when the sun goes up and the sun comes down and that kind of thing. What it is also is where are you in your life? Is your night present now? Is your day present now? In the nighttime, you can't see very well. You can't see where you're headed. It's trouble in night when you can't see. But if you are living in your daytime, if you're living during the day in your daytime, then you may be able to see what you want. Your, your, your money is flowing right. You, you're not waiting on a stimulus package. You have all that you need because it's daylight. My question to you today, do you pray? And do you fast night and day? Do you pray and fast in the good times as well as the bad times? Or do you choose one? Lord, I'm going to talk to you because I'm going through now. Lord, I'm going to come into a fast because I really need you to break this curse right now. Lord, I really need you to stop what's going on around me right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bind the devil in fasting and prayer. Prayer is needed in the nighttime as well as the daytime. It's needed in the daytime as well as the nighttime. Some people pray when things are going good. Some people fast when things are going good. I'm telling you today, Anna sets a good focus for us, sets a good pattern for us, sets a good structure for us, and that is prayer and fasting day and night. What part of the day are you in? What part of the week are you in? What part of the year are you in? We've been wrestling with this thing a year now. Have there been any fasting? Have there been any prayers going up? And then if we've been praying during the dark times, will we pray and fast during the good times? Because when we pray and we fast, we are keeping in touch and in tune with God. You want to make sure you do what Hannah does. Anna stays in touch and in tune with God. She tunes God in through fasting, and she follows up with her fasting with prayer. The question today is, does Anna set a good pattern for you? Verse number 38, Luke chapter 2, verse 38. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him. To all them that looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. She spoke about the Lord. Look at what it says. Verse number 38. She was coming in in this instant and she gave thanks. So here we find out she's a praying and praising and fasting woman. 
Not only does she worship in the temple, not only does she fast on a regular basis day and night, not only does she pray on a regular basis day and night, but she also prays. But she has a reason to praise. <clears throat> I told you earlier, she was looking to see the face of God. And here she is. She comes and she gives thanks because Jesus is born. And she coming in that instance gave thanks likewise unto the Lord. Remember now, things that are happening is Simeon has, has shown up at the temple. And when Simeon shows up, he's hanging around the temple. He's waiting on Jesus to show up, bring Mary and Joseph to the temple. So Jesus shows up at the temple. Simeon takes Jesus, thank the Lord for him and said, now, Lord, I can die. I have seen the face of God. I have seen the Savior. I've seen the Messiah for myself. Now I can die. Now here we have Hannah, or Anna, and she comes in and she sees the face of Jesus. She comes in at that very instance and she gives thanks. Let me tell you, when you actually really see Jesus, when you actually really see the face of Jesus, let me tell you, you ought to give thanks. Some of us, some of us have to get to a point where we push and prime ourselves to give thanks. That wasn't the case with Hannah. And, and I say Hannah and Anna back, back and forth because it's the same person. So, so we look at Anna, and, and Anna paints a picture for us. Let's talk about who she is. Hannah was an was a aged woman at least 84 years old. She was aged. She was a fasting woman. She was a woman who pushed food aside to tune God in and to get in touch with God. She was a praying woman. She was a woman that had connection with God because she prayed. The Bible says she prayed and she fasted night and day. So she was a fasting and a praying woman. She was an aged woman and she, we find out now she was a praising woman. Praising. She gave thanks on a regular basis. She, she thanked God. She, she praised him. We need some more praisers in the church. We need believers who would praise, who would give all glory to God because he's such a great and magnificent God and because he's done so many things. We also know that she was a witnessing woman, the prophetess. She was a witnessing woman. She not only was witnessing, she had faith of God. She had faith in God. She looked to see the face of God. She believed that God would show his face through Jesus Christ. So she sought to see Jesus. She told everybody. Look at what it says. It says she told people that she spoke to. How many people? All of them. This woman was getting on folks' nerves talking about Jesus. This woman was so concerned about people hearing about this great Messiah that will redeem Jerusalem. She talked about it to everybody she saw, and she talked about it everywhere she went. This woman, Anna, she told everybody about Jesus. She reminded people that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus was the Messiah. She reminded people that Jesus is the Messiah who is going to, in his present now, to deliver us all from our sins. The overarching theme of this particular Sunday school lesson is so people would know that Jesus has come to deliver them for their, from their sins. He has come for redemption. The word redemption means buying back. And what God has done through Jesus Christ, he has bought us back from the devil. Not only has he bought us back, he has also brought us back. He has redeemed us. He has set us free. So Hannah paints a picture of how every believer or the witness of, of the Lord or to make sure that we foretell of his goodness. Now, having been a prophetess at that time, she was foretelling. There is no need for us to foretell the first coming of Christ anymore. Christ has already come. He is, he is the Redeemer. 
We, re we receive him as the redeemer. He is Christ the redeemer. So she foretold of it and she, she witnessed to everybody she met. Let's move now to Acts chapter two. As I hurry along, I know I'm not flowing as smoothly as Brother Miles and, and Brother Whitlock does, but the fact of the matter is, I got a lot to unpack here. Amen? Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 16 through 21 is where we are. And uh, it's, it's kind of different because they put together so many passages of Scripture, especially when we're used to doing expository teaching and preaching where we take one passage and explain it. But let's look at this. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verses 16 through 21. Let me just bring you up to what's happening here. What's happening here is that when we move from Acts chapter 1 and, and verse number 8, Jesus has said to us that he will give us power and he will give them power, rather. He will give them power and the Holy Spirit will come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will, re, he will restate, reinstate, and he will restate what I've already told you. And he will give you power. When the Holy Spirit comes, mankind will have dunamis power. Number one, dunamis power is explosive power. Number two, excusius power. That means that we will have the authority and we will have the privilege to exhib exhibit our power. So the, Jesus has foretold the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so in Acts chapter two, beginning at verse number 16, it becomes a reality. It says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Let's back up a minute. So when Jesus says that there is there is going to be this great awakening, this power, this surge of, of the Holy Spirit will come on the scene, and, and it, it happens in Acts chapter 2, and when it happens, the Bible said there was a sound as a mighty rushing wind that came upon men, women, and, and they spoke in other tongues. They spoke in unknown tongues. They spoke in cloven tongues. And when they spoke in cloven tongues, what they did, for an example, I speak in English, but you hear it in another language. So as I speak in English, the Holy Spirit comes and he interprets that thing and you hear it in your own language. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit is our interpreter. He's the paraclete that walks beside us and tells us and tells people what God is saying. He's the paraclete. The Holy Spirit makes clear what God wants us to know. So here we are, we are at this point where, where the Holy Spirit has come, they have spoken in other tongues, and then somebody see these believers speaking in tongues, speaking in such a way that as they speak, other people hear them in their own language, in a different language, and somebody declares, these men must be drunk. And that's where, where we pick up today. Uh, Peter stands up and he starts preaching and Peter says, these men are not drunk because it's just the nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it, it's just, it's just early in the morning. It's so early until I know they ain't drunk and you know, they're not drunk. And in our vernacular, if we see it tomorrow on a modern day, the, the whiskey store ain't even open yet. <laughs> so in other words, uh, the theme here also is salvation. God is getting the attention a mankind through great miracles and wonders. The theme, the, the theme is still salvation and sanctification. In Acts chapter 2, they speak, they speak in other tongues, wonderful things happen. God has done great things. They are not, they are not drunk, Peter said. But this is what happened. This is taking place because of what Joel has said in the Old Testament. Joel said, then he recites what Joel said. He says, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. How much flesh? Every flesh, all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on, and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in the days, I will pour out in the in those days of the of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun 
shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what he says here is what you see happening today on this day of Pentecost, what you see happening is what the Old Testament prophet Joel said would happen. Don't get it so twisted until you use this for the modern day vernacular simply because he explains it in the text. Verse number 16, he says, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he says, he says very clearly, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So he poured out his spirit upon all flesh that day. The sons and the daughters prophesied. Again, this word prophesy mean they foretold, mean they, they bear witness. It means that, that they gave instructions of, of who Jesus is and what great things. Look at what it says, what wonderful things God had done. He goes on to say that I will not only pour out my spirit upon those of high rank, but I will pour out my spirit upon my servants. I will pour out my spirits upon my handmaids. He's pouring out his spirit this day upon all of them, the rich and the poor. He pours out his spirit upon all of them, even those who served other men and women. God poured out his spirit and they began to talk about the good things that God has done and the good things that God is going to do through Jesus Christ. Remember, the idea here is salvation. As they spoke another language, this moment, this moment was predicted by Job, the prophet Job. It was predicted by him. In the last days, God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and daughters, sons and daughters will, will have a inspiring speeches. <laughs> will have a group of inspiring speeches. They will be able to inspire men and women to follow Jesus Christ because they have the gift of prophecy. This word prophecy is, is divine speaking, inspiring speaking. It's witnessing. It is foretelling. And he says, he poured it out upon all flesh that day. On the day of Pentecost, he poured it out. He poured himself into all flesh that day. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. And God showed them wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. He showed them blood and fire and he showed them vapor of smoke. The sun did not did not shine because it was dark darkened and the moon dripped down and showed forth blood please remember this prophet is not talking about calvary the reason why we understand that he's not talking about calvary is because in order for the text to be true the entire text has to be true and the bible matthew mark luke nor john talks about fire on calvary so he's talking about this given moment. Joel says that there will come a day that my sons and daughters will prophesy. And this will be the day in Acts chapter 2, during the day of Pentecost, he poured out his spirit upon all flesh, even the handmaids. And it, he poured it out upon all flesh. He poured it out regardless of their status, regardless of their income, regardless of their gender, regardless of their age, regardless of their race, regardless of their insignificance, regardless if they were learned, whether they were educated, whether they were unlearned or uneducated, whether they were rich, whether they were poor, whether they were high ranking or low ranking, he poured out his spirit upon all that day. Now we have these believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, these believers in God, Speaking in one language and people hearing them in a different language. What a mighty God we serve. It was amazing. It was awesome. And he poured it upon all flesh, all believers. God has made it possible for us to receive salvation and believe, believing on Jesus, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. God has made it possible through Jesus Christ for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
He has made it possible through Jesus Christ that we can have salvation through him. We are all called to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to witness for. We, whether we are handmaids, whether we are servants or not, God shows forth his blessings. He shows forth his miracles. So we can use the history of those miracles and we can use what God has placed in us to get the attention of some lost world. God doesn't give us power just so we can show off our power. God doesn't give us power just so we can dazzle the people. God doesn't do great miracles just so we can talk about them and walk away from them. He does great miracles, uncommon miracles, so that men would come to Jesus Christ and come to know him. So he darkened the sun. He, he showed vapor and fire, blood. He, he showed the moon uh, went to blood. He, and he did it before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Before Jesus comes back, this had to take place, so it took place. Verse 21. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God is calling every person to repentance and every person to salvation. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. So he's setting a pattern, not just for, for then, but a pattern for us now. Don't get overly concerned about this speaking in tongues thing because salvation does not come through the speaking of your tongues. Salvation is in Jesus and Jesus alone. Salvation is in Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ and Jesus alone. Let's move to Acts 21 verses 8 and 9. In Acts 21 verses 8 and 9, we find the Apostle Paul in the text. It says in verse number 8, in the next day that in the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and aborted with him. Verse nine, in the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Paul, the Apostle Paul, has a company, a group of people who are supporting him in ministry and who are doing ministry with him. They depart where they were. They go to Caesarea Philippi. They go to Caesarea Philippi. And then when they get there, they go into the house of Philip, the evangelist. Look at the word very clearly here. In this particular text, Philip is an evangelist. Philip is one who is a preacher of the gospel. This Greek word is totally different from the Greek word of prophecy that we used in previous verses. So Philip here is one of the seven, meaning he's one of the seven deacons. So he was a preaching deacon or a deacon who preached. So he was an evangelist. You remember <clears throat> in Acts chapter 8, when Philip met the eunuch sitting in the chariot, riding in the chariot, reading from Isaiah 53, Philip rushed the chariot, asked the man, do you know what you're reading? He says, how can I know unless some man guides me? So Philip catches the chariot of a man who's very wealthy, a man who has powerful position. He sits with him. He reads the same passage of scripture where he was reading. He explains it to him. He convinces the man that Jesus is the son of God. That's what evangelists do. They convince, they allow God to use them as a catalyst to convince people that Jesus is the son of God. So the man says, I believe. The eunuch says, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. Immediately, the chariot stands still and, and Philip and the man both go down in the water and Philip baptizes him. Philip gets caught up in the spirit. He celebrates and finds himself somewhere else. In other words, he disappears. This is the same Philip. 
Philip is a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is one who is an evangelist. Paul stops by his house and he resides there. He aboards there with him is what the text says. He's there with him. And quite naturally now, you got to understand, if you go to an evangelist's house, you're going to be evangelized. So whoever was with Paul during that time, they had to hear this thing about Jesus. Well, Paul was comfortable with that because he loved hearing about Jesus. My question to you today, do you love hearing about Jesus? <laughs> do you love the fact that where you go, people talk about Jesus? Or do you run from people who are going to talk about Jesus? He's an evangelist. And then verse number nine says it like this, says that same, in the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And that passage, the, the Sunday school lesson just leaves it at that and just hangs it out there. So we have to deal with what the Sunday school lesson gives us. So he says he had four daughters. They were virgins, meaning they were not married, which did prophesy, meaning that they publicly spoke. They publicly uh, uh, foretold, they publicly witnessed, they divinely spoke, and they did it publicly. They, they also prophesied. They shared publicly their witness of Jesus Christ. They shared their convictions. They shared their witness. They foretold they were unmarried girls. Which tells us the entire family Philip, it doesn't say much, uh, it doesn't say anything here about the woman of the house, whether he had a wife and they had a mother present, but it does say that the entire family that is called out in this text was maintaining their place in ministry. Every one of us are called to maintain our place in ministry. We are called to share our convictions we are called to share what we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. They sought to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Somebody here today need to know that you need to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And just like in families these days, during this time, uh, in Philip's family, the whole family was involved in ministry. Let me tell you, your whole family ought to be involved in ministry. Your whole family ought to be involved in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Because the good news and the sharing of Jesus Christ is not limited to any, any gender, any status, any generation. We all have to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. And what is the gospel? The fact that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you. He was buried in a barber tomb. He rose from the dead. He is the son of God. And if you're listening to me today and you can believe this story, that Jesus is the son of God, you can be just like the eunuch. You should be baptized if you believe the story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a barbed tomb. He rose from the dead. And you can invite him into your life even right now. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. And thank him for saving your soul. Thank you so much for listening to our Sunday school lesson this morning. And thank you for not hanging up on me when you found out that the, the normal teachers weren't present. So thank you so much for being a part of this service with us. Please continue to join us for Sunday school every Sunday morning. Our Sunday school time is at 9 a.m. Our worship service will begin today as every Sunday at 1045 a.m. And our Bible study is on, on Wednesday night at 720 p.m. You can give your offering even during the Sunday school period by our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com or you can go ahead and mail in your offering your offering can be mailed in to p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 p.o box 503 missouri city texas 775 77459 
Thank you so much again for joining us. Thanks for being a part of our service. We're glad that you have shown up and we're glad that you have, have uh, gleaned great things from the lesson. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for those who have set godly examples for us to follow. We ask you to bless us, Father God, to follow those examples and be a part of you and allow you to be a part of us. And we thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you again. Look forward to seeing you at 1045 a.m. this morning, 1045 a.m. for worship service. Thank you so much for being a part of our service on today.